you. Okay. Um, I don't want that there. Dave, can you tell us um, a little bit about um, you were working in the shipyards yeah. first before you opened yeah. the shop. Can you tell us about that? I worked in the shipyard time? from 1956 right up to 1978. So really all my international uh, career on the bag was when I worked in the shipyard. So you had to fit the training in with your work. You know, in them days there was no sponsorship, no real help. Um, people would laugh now. I got picked one year, 1966, I had rode the Commonwealth Games in Jamaica, where I finished fifth, uh, which is still the best place. No Northern Ireland rider has beat that yet. Uh, but when I come home, there was a notice and I drove to Tour Ireland then and then there was a notice and to go to the World Championships in Germany in the Nuremberg Ring. And um, it was hard to get time off work because you was rearing a small family. Uh, and in them days you had to pay £10 towards the trip yourself, um, which was a lot of money, plus time off work. But the shipyard, the boys is pretty decent and they had a whip round for the, let me take the time off. But it's, the way it worked is, you know, there was no team manager, no nothing. I got a plane from Nutch Corner Airport till, um, till London. I changed at London. This is early in the morning, like from about half seven I was travelling. Uh, I got a, a plane then from London to Dusseldorf. I got out of Dusseldorf and got on a train to Cologne. And I could speak a bit of French, but I couldn't speak much German. And I got out of Cologne and went round and collected all my uh, things for the race, my, um, my number signed on, and all in a sporting hall. In, in Cologne, then I had to get on a, a train and travel to um, the Black Forest and I got out in a small German village called Adner, it's in the bottom of the Black Mountains and uh, the best time was about 8 o'clock at night. You know, and then nobody with me, so I had to find a small <coughs> hotel and I got a place and was able to get through a bit, a bit of language, got a bit of supper, went to bed, got up the next morning and <laughs> like I had a, my bike, my race bike, but with a saddle bag on it, with my racing gear, right? There was no such thing then as team cars or nothing for us, so I, I had my racing kit and the saddle bag, just ordinary trousers, shoes, put my trousers down my socks, got on the bike and rode up till the Nuremberg Ring and I didn't realise, I knew it was only about 8 kilometres, but it was 8 kilometres straight uphill. <laughs> I got up to the Nuremberg Ring and there was nothing booked for me, you know, because that's the way they worked in Ireland, you just took your chances. But lucky enough I fell in with one of the great um, British cyclists, um, Les West. Les West was a, a legend. He had finished, you know, in a lot of championships and won a lot of races. And I knew Les West well, and I knew Colin Lewis. So they were riding on the British team, and they said that they had a, a, a place booked and I might get in there. So I went in, and, but there was no more room. But they said they would they would bunk me up in a, a bed in the somewhere. And the, the manager of the place came down, and he wasn't too keen on it, but he says, look, my sister lives across the road. You can go over there and sleep, and you eat here. So um, that was all right. And uh, got a bit of food, and I was along with Beryl Burton. She was there, and then the next um, and one of my friends came down, Tommy Simpson, who had won the World uh, Pro Race the year before. And I'd rode in San Sebastian with him, I'd rode amateur race in San Sebastian in 65. So he was a defending champion in 66. So Tommy arrived and uh, we, we rode around the circuit together, me and Tommy, Barry Hoban, Finn Denson, all pro legends. And Che Elliott was there at the time as well. 
Uh, so there was only myself and Liam uh, Horner on the Irish team. So Liam arrived down, but uh, unfortunately there was no place for Liam to stay. And people would laugh now, but Liam done, he stayed in the same place as me. But the girl says, look, there's no bed, so they put a tent up in the garden. So he slept in the tent with his bike beside him all night to raid a world championship the next day, you know. And uh, that's, that's, that's a thing that we just accepted as normal. You know, it wasn't to say... Uh, this was out of the ordinary, it was just the way our country had, we didn't have a lot of money. But when you, you know, you were competing with top Italians and the, the Poles and the Swedes and who had everything, but we, we were very lucky, we fell in with a man called Herman Nice. he's a Belgian, and he seemed to take the Irish, the reason was, he was in the, the army uh, during the war, and he was stationed in Larne, in Northern Ireland, and he got to know the Northern Ireland people. So uh, when we went over to any race over there, Herman would have turned up with a car and support for us. And he used to bring us down to his house and uh, we got a meal in that. And later on, Herman was lucky because he looked after Morris Foster, Liam Horner and myself. But when Kelly came along, when I was just going out of the international scene when Kelly was coming in. So we used to look after Kelly and keep him right, tell him what to do. So he, was, he had talent, but he was very raw, you know, to, to know tactics and racing and stuff. And Herman, then when Sean turned pro, he went over to live in Belgium and he lived with Herman for 12 years. Herman looked after him, so at least Herman got a, a good Irish man, maybe not like some of us Wallies. <laughs> and uh, when Sean, later in his career, won a big pro race, Herman would have raised the, the, the flag in the back garden, the flagpole, and uh, all Sean's, a lot of Sean's trophies and a lot of his winning jerseys all decked out um, Herman's house over the years and even when the Belgian Federation were updating their journeys for motor pacing, he brought, he bought one of them for the Federation here and brought it over to Northern Ireland for us and we used it at Orangefield Track, you know, so we had a lot of friends like that which, which we needed. It was the same even, it was the same here, when I worked in a shipyard, I used to ride home, get a spare pair of wheels, tie them on the handlebars, ride to Lisbon, race on the track, change my wheels, ride home from Lisbon, get, get to bed and go to work the next, the next day. I remember one time, I wasn't a great time trialist. I could have rode a time trial. I, I just got my, my mind to it because in 1964, it was our club's 50th anniversary, our golden anniversary, and actually next year is our 100 years. So that's because our club was formed in 1914. But in 1964, I'd won the Northern Ireland Road Championships over a circuit in Mail Bush. And uh, it was the first Northern Ireland Championship winner that the club had for years. So the club then kind of way talked me in to go for the Belfast Dublin record, which had stood <coughs> from 1952 to George Wilkes in four hours, 32 minutes. So I said, OK, I'll go for it. And, and in the autumn of that year, I went and I broke the record and brought it down to a 4.29, which I was pleased with because at that time the uh, Belfast of Dublin was a blue band of time trailing. Yet I was a, a roadman, but I was able to adapt myself. But it was very hard mentally to, to record breaking because you don't have any man to catch you of your timetable and your stopwatch. And there was no fancy uh, power cranks or nothing like them days. It was your ordinary bike that you rode the shipyard, that you rode the road races, that you rode the time trails with. You just put a, a lighter jersey on. It was as simple as that. There was no disc wheels, there was nothing. Can you tell us about these bikes? Like, um, Were they 10 speed at the time? They were 10 speed with, I always rode 175 cranks because I was long in the legs with 
a 44 54 chain rings with like a 13 21 block and that was it and, and they were of course they were steel frames steel frames uh, i got my frames made by um, ernie whitcomb he was a small builder in london built all my frames for me over the years and looked after me well that way but uh, the dublin record it, it was always a nice thing to have but i um i lost it then to morris foster in 69 and then i went for it in 71 and i got it down to four hours 18 minutes and that stood for 27 years until tommy evans broke it but in time term terms as i say i was more roadman and there was a funny story in 1965, I got selected to ride the World Championships in San Sebastian in um, September, so I needed to be doing a lot of training over the July holidays. But with the, um, the shutdown here in July, there's not much racing. But the All Ireland 100 Mile Time Trial Championships was in the south, and me and two teammates. I said, look, we'll go down there because it would be good training for me for the, the world, saying there's no reason may as well ride a time trial. But we're very laid back about it. And uh, on the Saturday, the Ballymena Road Club were very much time trialers. On the Saturday, the 10 made time trial in Ballymena, which I went up and rode. And all the Ballam a lot of Ballymena men weren't there. They had went down to especially to prepare for the 100, to stay overnight, to be fresh. In the south, yes. Yeah, whereas I rode the 10, I think I finished second or third to Morris Foster. Come back to Belfast, rode home, got ready on the Sunday morning about half five to drive down to Dublin, the three of us. And we just got outside Dublin and we're running a patrol. So we said, ah, we're not that keen anyway. So We'll wait the garage opens and we'll just go down to the Wicklow Mountains and do a day's training. But we're right a corner and there's a garage open, so we've got a tin of petrol, put it in. This is how laid back we were. So it was, I started in the, in the 100 mile time trial and it was a, a very rough day. It was a gale blowing and it was really into the teeth of the gale, the first 25 mile out towards uh, Navin. And then we're cut across the Slane. But I knew my form was good because I was getting the gears around well. But all the top time trials in Ireland were riding, and I maybe wouldn't have been considered in that bracket. But in the second half, I found it was I was going very well, and with about 15 metres, I caught a lot of riders. I caught I seen this boy in the distance, and it was a boy from Ballymena who should be maybe winning or getting in the top three, and I caught him for seven minutes. And went bam, so I thought to myself, you're going okay here. And I finished and the timekeeper says, you've got the fastest time. It wasn't a really f fast time, it was four hours, it was four hours, 21 minutes. And he says, you're fastest. And he says, well, I've won it then. Because he says, no, there's a lot more riders to come in. I says, yeah, but I've caught them all. So, and one of my mates in the club had done a personal best, and he finished second, tell me. And there's a chap called Jackie Watson. He's one of the top uh, officials of the UCA now. And Jack was our third counter, and we worked it out that Jack had only to do just below five hours, and we'd have won the team. So we were all changing, and he was still out in the road, and we went out to give him a bit of encouragement. And I'll not tell you the words he told us, because he was suffering He's, and uh, so we got out of his road and he did finish and we won the team so we first and second and I won the championship and the team and I couldn't believe it, you know I had beat the, the Ballymena team time, the time trial man but you know these things you just some days it was one of them days where I could have pushed the pedals out you don't get many days like that so you have to take advantage of it okay yeah. and at the time you were working at the shipyard yeah, yeah okay full time Okay. What was your training regime like then? When did you train? Did you cycle into work? Yeah, yeah. Okay. I would have done maybe 45 minutes or an hour in the morning and st straight out of work at, um, uh, at the left then about half, half four and I would have trained for roughly two, two and a half hours. Okay, Most after days, putting in a day's work? Yeah, I would have been knocking in around the 400 mile a week. Yes. Okay, amazing. Yeah, because most of the races then, 
were, were longer than, than they are now. When I rode the, the British milk race, it was a 15-day race with no rest day. And, you know, a short stage and it was around 110 miles. So you were riding stages of 130, 140 miles. Okay. Did you have any support crew for the milk race? Because you weren't, you know, a brother. Well, the milk race was funny, but some of the times we weren't able to fill the full Irish team because we weren't, we hadn't enough good riders. And a lot of times I rode what they call an inter all stars team, where there was maybe two from Ireland, Scotch, there was a Scotchman rode with a couple of Canadians, Ella Mann and a, 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 I was riding with a couple of Australians, you know, and we, we they supplied us then with a the team manager and mechanic. So at the milk races, it was okay. good, you were, you were looked after okay. But then the, the Tour of Ireland now, it was an eight day race, very good race, strong race. And, a lot of good riders have rode it over the years, but the Tour of Ireland, when you finished, you just got a bag in your back and you rode maybe an hour ten mile out to some wee country house that somebody was putting you up for the night. But that was, that was, that was racing. Okay. I'm very interested in the certificate you have up on the wall. That's for one of your Belfast yeah, Dublin yeah, records, isn't yeah, it? Yeah. Okay, I'm just going to get a shot of that and then... Um, Okay, great. And can you tell us a little bit about about that event? That was your record for four hours and twenty one minutes. Yeah, yeah. Okay. That was that was a one in seventy one. Yeah. It takes a lot of planning. Okay. Because at that time you had the border post, so you had to have people going in front to clear you at the border, so you got you didn't get stopped. Okay, uh, that would slow you down. Clear run through. So okay. what happened was I had a, fo I had a following car yeah. with my spare bag and yeah. wheels yeah. in it and uh, food if I needed food. But then there was a, another car with officials in it with the timekeepers and all. And then there was observers from neutral clubs to make sure that you didn't take pace from uh, lorries or anything like that. But when you came to the border, one of the boys out of our own team car had to get out and get on his bike and ride behind me in case I punctured because the border <coughs> once stopped the cars. They mm. had to go through officially, whereas I got through, so the boy was riding behind me in case I punctured so I could jump on his bike till they got mm. my bike fixed. The problem was then, it wasn't like now where you had all the, the bypasses, you had to come through all the towns. And one of the worst was Drogheda because in that time the new Boyne Bridge wasn't built. So you were going to do Drogheda on a Sunday morning near rush hour and you were dodging people and then coming into Belfast you had to come down the Lisburn Road and uh, you didn't get a clear run like the traffic lights were still there okay. and some of the officials would have went in front and if the, if the traffic was clear they would have waved you through. Um, you said you were cycling in the 60s, is that right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, was there an increase in traffic in the 60s compared to the 70s? In the 60s, was most of the, the time trails on a Sunday morning. In the 60s, and that was very quiet. So the were the roads okay. were, were very quiet. Uh, the big thing in them days was club runs. Because most people, you know, like, a lot of people then used their bike for commuting to work, for their leisure, for their racing. And it was, you know, because cars weren't, families didn't have money to have cars at that time. So the bike was used for everything, you know. And uh, you used to have, there was a thing called sprint carriers that you could bolt onto the front wheel, which would carry two wheels and then you put a toe strap on them. Terry's, on, Terry made them, I Terry's think. Terry's made them and they put them on the handbars. So you're able to ride in event and then change your wheels. Okay. Is that what you use when you cycle to the track in Lisburn? Yeah, yeah. On okay. the time trials in Adam Road. Okay, that's like a bit of a workout in itself, just cycling to Lisburn and then to um, compete on the yeah. track. Okay. Track racing, uh, in the six, fifth, late 50s and 60s, track racing was bigger than road racing. Because at that time we had a track in Porty Down with a track in Lisburn, with a track at the Grove in the Shore Road. 
And then Orangeville got opened in 1958. I, I rode the opening meeting in Orangeville. But I also rode grass track racing. I won the All-Ireland Two Mile Grass Championships in 65 at Ravenhill. And I won it again in 66 at Balmoral. We, we would have rode the grass racing and intertwined with sports meetings. The only thing you had to watch when you were warming up that somebody wasn't throwing a javelin and the javelin would land in the middle of the track. You know, everybody just mucked in with everybody else. I remember riding the grass meeting up in Bunkrana and it was on a just a standard farmer's field. But there was bulrushes in it and what they'd done is they just cut the bulrushes off by the neck by a size and then filled it with sand. And it wasn't even level, it was part of it was downhill and you come down and you sunk into this and it was like going up a mountain and right out of it again, you know, and they just had the flags around, but grass track racing, it's still very popular in the mainland, but uh, it stayed here. Okay. You mentioned the Grove, there was a track on yeah. the Grove, do you have any memories of the track yeah, yeah. on the Grove? Yeah, the first thing about it, it was a, a red shield track, and it was too big, it was a half mile track, so it was very big, so it was very windy. But the problem was with the, the red shield, you, would, you had to nearly strip your bike down every time because it was like sand, got in around the bearings and everything. And like if you fell off on it, it was like sandpaper. And was it pretty dusty too? Would it get yeah, in your yeah, eyes as well? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. And, um, and then you mentioned Ravenhill. That's the first I've heard of a track on the Ravenhill. It's just, a, it's just an ordinary sports track. Okay. Just an ordinary running yeah. sports track track and grass. There was no bankings or nothing like that. You know, you just rode the, the, the bike ride. It was a quarter mile running track, on, but it was grass. Okay. And the same at, at Balmoral. And would you ride with a brake on your bike and then when you arrive at the track you would remove the brake? Did they make yeah. you remove the brakes back then? Yeah, but we, we, we had a novel idea. We used a cantilever brake that fitted on the front. So okay. when the wire on the cantilever we would have just put a toe strap through the wire and put it around the stem so you didn't need a brake lever or a cable. So then you just pulled your toe strap Great. and I, I put the brake on for you. So it was two, two, two minutes when I took it off at the track then. Okay, brilliant. But the track was really good because it taught you to handle your bike. You know, that nowadays there's more and more crashes in the race because I don't think people adapt too much with riding in groups like we have rode bunch races on the track and road races and you know when it, even in the southern Ireland at that time there was maybe 120 in a bunch race so when I went to the continent and, you know when I rode the world championships you were talking maybe 280 riders but you were able to hold your own in any of those groups so you were okay great yeah. okay and uh, and what about fuel like what type of food were you eating back then like to fuel yourself for a race or? Well, there was no such things as gels and all that. It was a few bananas in your back pocket and a few jam bodies, like. Okay. You know, that was it, like. You know, you would have had a good breakfast, a porridge or whatever, normal food, but there was nothing specific then. Um, and raiders would have just put in their pockets what suited themselves. You know, a lot of a lot of people. When we rode to Tour Island, when you're riding down the start, you'd have went down to the bakery and got a lot of um, fruit squares and stuff like that and had them in your pocket. Uh, if it was a big long stage race, you maybe would have had a uh, a chicken leg in your pocket, which you would eat early on in the stage. Okay, great. Yeah. And, but and the same with drinks. The drinks there was no fancy fuel. It was just standard water or whatever, lemon tea and stuff like that in your bottle. The big thing then was, and I think it was a big problem in all sports, people were totally dehydrated because you weren't taught to drink. You know, you used to ride 50 mile time trial with no bottle in your bag. You know, that was it. Like, you know, it was the same but with athletics and everything. You know, you yeah. had people collapsing at the end of marathons and all because they weren't taking enough fuel, even swimming. You never oh, seen swimmers with a, a bottle at the side of the pool in them days, which you do now, because people's more educated now that they need to drink a certain amount of water. They just didn't know, they didn't realise. They didn't know, and it's a, that's a big problem with the older generation of athletes. 
of, of cycling yeah. or whatever. Yeah. They have trouble with kidneys and stuff like that because the in the early days yeah. they were doing high yeah. activity performances but weren't consuming yeah. enough fluid. Okay. And um, have you always stayed on top of using um, like you know, the latest technology in bikes? Did you always upgrade your bikes? I usually did. Um, I wouldn't uh, I was always on top of my game that way, you know, and gearing and, and what was coming out new, but you had to just use what you could afford. That was a problem. And then stuff didn't change as quick in them days. Okay. So the, your stuff that you bought would have lasted you a few years. You maybe changed brake blocks and chains and stuff, but the rear gears would have been the same in one year as it would the next year. It wasn't big dramatic changes. That didn't happen really till the 80s, 90s, and then stuff started to change uh, dramatically. And, and then the stuff got a lot lighter and new materials because of the space program. There was new materials, titaniums and carbons and all this came into the, okay. the, the game. And how did you feel about carbon when it first came out? Were you like for it or were you thinking no? Yeah, I was always for it, yeah. Yeah, new material. It, you know, it, it was getting used in boats, it was getting used in fishing rods. It was, I went to the Commonwealth Games one time with Mike Bull and he had these two big poles, pole bottom poles, and they were made like a, a, a special cane wood. And they were way at a ton like, you know, and then, and then a lot of years later they were using carbon fibre poles to pole vault, you know, so it was all progress. Okay. Um, I want to ask you about the shop. Um, how did you decide to open up a shop? Because in them days, um, it was very hard to get any equipment at all because okay. nobody was bringing it in. But with me racing in the continent and living there for a while, I had good contacts in the continent. And um, I decided, you know, to start the open a shop up that was going to sell the type of equipment that was getting used on the continent and getting used in the top races and custom built bikes for people. You know, okay. I had good contacts of getting frames done and then there was very few people here and even would have built wheels you know good good wheels and i had been building wheels from when i was about 15. Okay. you were still working at the shipyards when you opened up your shop um so was it a big decision for you to leave yes, your job well, at the shipyard and the wife run the shop um, and i used to come in in the evenings and work okay. the late doing the repairs and stuff like that you know okay. Oh, okay, great. Thanks, man. Right, enjoy it. Okay, I'll stick it on.